Once again, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. My name is Lisa Terich. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Oshawa Museum, which is managed by the Oshawa Historical Society. And our virtual speaker series is um, a monthly event that happens on the third Tuesday of the month, January to May, and then again from September to November. So we've got different talks of different historical nature throughout the year. Um, it always happens on the third Tuesday of the month at 7 p.m. And I would recommend checking out the Oshawa Historical Society's website for a look at what's to come for November. And then we've got the beginning of 2022 all planned out. So uh, be sure to check the website for that information. slide is not advancing. My, there we are. We do like to start all of our meetings by acknowledging that the Oshawa Museum is situated on the traditional territory and treaty lands of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nations. Our work on these lands acknowledges the signatory communities of the Williams Treaties, as well as the Mississauga Nation and other members of the broader Indigenous community for their resilience and their long-standing contributions to the area now known as the Durham Region. Tonight's guest speakers are people I'm quite familiar with, and many historical <laughs> society members are too. They're very familiar faces to the museum. The talk tonight is Decorating the Dead, Coffin Hardware, and the Farewell Cemetery. And we have two guest speakers tonight. Melissa Cole was born and raised in Oshawa. She's worked at the Oshawa Museum for 20 years, and she has a Bachelor of Arts Honours degree in Anthropology from Trent University and a Museum Management and Curatorship Certificate from Fleming College. Melissa cares for the extensive artifact collection held at the Oshawa Museum. Her position involves research and communication of research findings in, in exhibits and audiovisual scripts, reports, articles, or books. Melissa is also responsible for the design and overseeing of the construction, fabrication, installation, and maintenance of exhibits. She is passionate about her hometown heritage and challenging the traditional story and history of Oshawa. Also tonight, we have Laura Suchin, and she is the Executive Director of the Oshawa Museum. Laura's passion for public history has led to conference presentations at provincial, national, and international conferences, including the Ontario Museum Association, History of Education Society, and the Association for Gravestone Studies. In 2005, Laura developed a classification system for 19th century Ontario gravestones, which allows for a more systematic approach to the transcript, uh, to the transcription and preservation of gravestones. This work led to the publication of her first book, Memento Mori, Classifying 19th Century Ontario Gravestones, and that was published in 2009. An article based on this research was awarded the Doug Grandy Award for the best article published that year by the Durham Region Chapter of the Ontario Genealogical Society in 2010. She currently contributes her time to several committees, including the Ontario Historical Society, the Cemeteries Committee as part of the Ontario Historical Society, and the Women's Herstory Connection of Durham Region. Thank you all so much and, and welcome to our guest speakers. Thank you very much, Lisa, for that lovely introduction. I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Can everybody see that okay? And you can hear me okay? Excellent. Okay, so for the first part of tonight's presentation, um, I'm going to share a little bit about the background um, about Farewell Cemetery and the reasons for the excavation and the process that took place. And this excavation was completed by Archaeological Services um, Incorporated. And Laura will go into a bit more detail about the coffin hardware itself. Um, and this collection is uh, part of our collection at the museum. So 19th century attitudes towards death involved elaborate, elaborate burial customs and rituals that were defined and strictly adhered to as much as finances and circumstances would allow at the time. Magazines of the day, such as the Ladies' Home Journal, often carried advice for customs related to mourning and what was considered to be both acceptable choices related to clothing and behavior during the mourning period. 
Think of the ballroom's reaction when the recently whittled Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind accepts Mr. Butler's offer to dance, and you get some indication of how rigid and deeply entrenched the mourning culture was in the 19th century. This culture also extended to the graveyard, uh, where a visit to any 19th century example will reveal a variety of gravestone carvings, uh, ranging from willow trees, urns, cherubs, lambs. Quite often you'll see animals on, on children's markers. This visible display of commemoration was a deeply personal choice and was influenced to some extent by economic status and the period in which the stone was carved. But what's not visible now are the ways in which the Victorians ornamented and personalized the coffins of the deceased. So this is an image of Farewell Cemetery for those that might not be familiar with it. It is tucked away. Um, it's located on Harmony Road. It's on the southeast corner of Harmony Road and King Street. There is a townhouse, townhouse complex on the corner and the cemetery is just kind of tucked away um, just to the south of that. And here is uh, an image of it uh, today. So the property on which the cemetery is located is a few hundred feet south of King, King Street and was given by Accius Moody Farewell to be used as a private burial ground for the Farewell family and their relatives. The Brown and Hinkson families were also granted permission to bury their relatives in the cemetery. Mr. Farewell divided the property to ensure that each of his sons, Accius and William, received a portion of the cemetery for their use as well. The cemetery was in use until 1937 and it eventually became under the ownership of the municipality and was officially closed to burials in 1968. In 1979, the city of Oshawa had a cairn constructed to display many of the headstones. And it contains the majority of the cemetery's approximately 60 to 70 uh, headstones. The old cemetery remained virtually unnoticed until approximately 1993 when a plan to widen the north-south road adjacent to the cemetery uncovered 36 grave shafts located within the road allowance. Subsequent investigations revealed that the cemetery had encroached eight and a half meters into the original road allowance sometime during the 19th or early 20th century. The cemetery was declared unapproved and an archeological firm was hired to investigate and remove the remains and to reinter them within the cemetery boundaries. The excavation of a graveyard does not, is not done merely as a historical investigation, but out of necessity. A portion of the Harmony Road Cemetery was, was designated as being an unapproved cemetery. The following is a quote from the commissioner's report to the Works Committee of the Regional Municipality of Durham. Quote, pre-engineering pre -engineering studies undertaken in preparation for the proposed reconstruction of Harmony Road regional road number 33, between Bloor Street and King Street have revealed that approximately 36 graves within the Farewell Pioneer Cemetery are presently outside the boundary of this cemetery and are encroaching on the right-of-way allowance of this dedicated thoroughfare. In order to align Harmony Road for the proposed widening from two to four lanes, it is necessary to reclaim the regional road allowance." Unquote. Before I go on to the next slide, I do want to I do want to notify you that there is one sensitive image that does contain um, human bones in it, but it is a smaller image. So once the necessity has been proven, it is imperative that all aspects of the project be handled in a professional and accountable manner. This is not only done out of respect for the individuals buried there, but also because of the wealth of in information that proper excavation and artifact care can produce. A wide variety of professionals became involved in the project and staff at the Osho Museum were also witness to it. Archaeological Services Incorporated selected specifically trained archaeologists to excavate the Harmony Road Cemetery. In all professions there are specialists and there are specialized archaeologists for specific field work. The archaeologist who directed the excavation on site was Chris Dudar who was given the title Project Osteologist, and he can be seen in one of these images in the top corner here. 
An osteologist in simple terms is a bone expert, one who is most able to discern sex, age, and some diseases from skeletal remains. The archaeologists excavated each grave individually and made sketches and notes as they worked as archaeologists typically do. And we actually have all these sketches. Um, they're contained within um, the archaeological report that is um, on file within the Oshawa archives. So this is um, the site plan from 1992 that accompanied the initial report that was submitted to the regional municipality of Durham. So you can actually see in this image, I'm not sure um, how you're viewing the presentation, but you can see that there was previous work done and you can see where a water main has already been constructed kind of in the lower um, left corner. You can see existing trench where a water main went in. Um, so you can see that there has already been a bit of disturbance and that's kind of those lines there are showing you where the curb sidewalks and such will go. Um, there's a yellow box there showing where reburial will be. Um, so this, this shows the condition of the property and it shows the location of all the known grave shafts at the time that were known. The enclosed area at the time, there's a little um, in the middle there, there's um, a couple of burials that are um, outlined and they were members of the Brown family, it was determined. And they're actually able to de determine this because noted in the previous photograph, um, you can see some of these footstones um, bearing names. And one of them had the name Sarah B on it. And an inventory had been completed um, by the foreman of parks, uh, Mr. Bill uh, Galbraith. And it showed that only two individuals listed on this list had that name. It was Sarah B and Sarah Nee Copper, Nee Cooper Brown, so, sorry, so Sarah B could have been Sarah Nee Cooper Brown, or it could have been her daughter, who was also called Sarah. Um, so, therefore, it was possible to identify this enclosure as the Brown family plot. And then I showed the yellow box showing um, where the reburial would be um, taking place. So a little bit of history about the undertaking uh, business um, before we get into uh, the coffin jewelry. So in the early days of settlement and colonization, the local cabinet and furniture makers were tasked with the production and selling of coffins. Already supplied with the necessary materials for coffin making, furniture makers most likely found the coffin trade to be a good way to supplement uh, their business in times when the furniture business might have been slow. So Luke and Brother of Oshawa was one such furniture company offering simple, plain wooden coffins in addition to the more mainstream furniture side of their business. This furniture and undertaking business was started by members of the Luke family in 1853. The Luke brothers had a, a booming business in the furniture trade as more and more new homes were being built in Oshawa. The undertaking department, uh, Luke and Brother, advertised professional qualified staff, caskets and all requisites were carried. Coffins were, were for the most part unadorned until the middle of the 19th century. After that, it became the norm to decorate coffins to create a totally unique look. As coffin decoration became more elaborate, it became less desirable to replicate the exact look of another coffin. Therefore, furniture makers were able to were asked to undertake many of the funeral arrangements. So Luke and Brother advertisements in local papers show that they are offering services of undertaking and funerals complete with hearse and horses alongside their furniture, engravings, and frames. As time went by, many furniture makers began to dedicate part of their own business, laying out the deceased and providing a, seti, a setting for the family to receive friends. For some, the funeral side of the business be began to increasingly dominate the furniture trade. The funeral home business founded by the Luke brothers is still in operation today under the name Macintosh Anderson Kellum, known as Mac. And so this, uh, this is an image, an early image here of Luke and brother of Oshawa with their hearse in an early ad. And here's another image of their storefront that was located on King Street, approximately where um, La Quinta Suites Hotel is today. The building itself no longer exists, but uh, this is the, an image of it from uh, 1911. And so leaving on that note, I'm now going to hand uh, Laura will take over the rest of the presentation here to talk about 
the actual coffin hardware. Wonderful, thank you, Melissa. You can advance the slide, perfect. Okay. So as Melissa outlined a bit of the history of Farewell Cemetery and the reason for the archeological excavation, I'm now gonna focus a bit on the coffin hardware and some of the symbolism associated with it. So funeral merchandise catalogs were actually produced illustrating coffin and casket hardware and all kinds of funeral accessories. An example of one of these catalogs is shown here, which is from the Hearns Brothers and Company of Whitakers, North Carolina, and it showed a vast array of coffin hardware designs. So companies like the Luke Brothers would order pieces from catalogs such as this. They'd order it either for mail delivery, by telephone, or even telegraph. And sometimes even a traveling salesman would appear at the door, always to ensure that they had stock of all these different um, designs. Name plates, coffin ornaments, handles, lifts, escutcheons, and coffin studs could all be ordered from catalogs in various finishes, styles, and colors to provide individuality to coffins. These finishes could be ordered in a variety of designs, and in many cases, they were ordered in a complete casket trimming set, which is illustrated on the screen. These sets would contain four handles, one nameplate, two cap lifts, four thumb screws, four screw plates, and handle screws. Floral designs and depictions of animals, especially sheep, were very popular. However, there was a lot of geometric flourishes, flourishes, which were also quite popular and could be ordered from these catalogs. Most pieces of ornamentation were available in your choice of silver, gold, ebony, oxidized brass, and copper, depending on your preference and your budget. And Melissa, next slide. Sorry, it's my computer is just yeah, not no letting worries. it advance. It, I'll, I'll, I'll get it to advance eventually. Yep, no I'm not worries. sure why it's frozen. <laughs> <laughs> so the Hearns Brother catalog, the one we're looking yeah. at, dates to about 1900. Uh, they even had clothing in the catalog, and that's how we know the date of it uh, from the clothing styles that uh, were in there. So coffin nameplates were decorative attachments uh, to the coffins, and they were often placed in the center of the coffin. These plates could have a name, birth, and death date of the deceased inscribed on them and came in many different shapes and sizes. Coffin nameplates could also be ordered with inscriptions such as at rest, father, mother, rest in peace, and our babe. Nameplates were made of different metals with lead, brass, or tin being the most popular. Their choice would reflect the status and wealth of the deceased and his family. So for instance, in the upper left corner, you see the coffin plate of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, this dates from 1865, and it was an elaborate sterling silver shield adorned with a wreath at the top, engraved with his name, birth, and death dates, as well as the words 16th President of the United States. And you can compare that to the simplicity of the other nameplates on the screen. As coffin nameplates began to increase in popularity, they were often removed by loved ones to be kept as mementos of the deceased. Uh, this practice peaked in the late 19th century. And I know I've seen a few in antique stores um, that I've been in. Uh, you'll see a coffin plate in a shadow box or a type of frame. I have come across a few of those. Where they were actually taken off the coffin. All right, next one. Before the practice of embalming became more established, coffin windows were common. And these windows were formed by 
really just making a hole in the coffin lid and covering it with a pane of glass. These windows were fixed in place and used to view the body with, without having to have the coffin open. And this is an example of a uh, conserved coffin window from the Farewell um, collection. Uh, it was in a number of pieces and the conservators were able to uh, put it back together and you can see its, um, its shape. And it was actually laid on top uh, when we saw it first, it was laid on top of the body because the coffin had um, deteriorated to the point where it was just lying on the body. Uh, what was interesting about these coffin windows as well is as some people uh, say that these windows might have been used to prevent accidental burial of people that were alive. There's uh, quite a thing in the the Victorian um, era about um, ways to prevent uh, burials of people that weren't dead, just appearing dead. And they say that sometimes these coffin windows were used because if you saw condensation, then you'd know the person was breathing and they were still alive. But I think it was mostly for the embalming. Now, ornamentation could also be purchased to reflect memberships in organization and religious ideals. So membership in fraternal or secret organizations were very popular in the 19th century. It's estimated that there was about 2,000 such organizations in existence at one time or another in North America. So it's no surprise that in the Hearn Brothers catalog, we would see pages offering coffin emblems representing several of the most popular organizations, including the Masons, Knights of Pythias, Oddfellows, Woodmen of the World, and because it's an American catalog, we had the Junior United American Mechanics. The coffin embellishments of these organizations were quite ornate and cast in great detail to represent the logos of the organizations. On occasion, portions of these ornaments were cast separately to render the effect of a very bold relief, adding to the very striking uh, nature of these emblems. We didn't find any of these in, um, in the Farewell Cemetery, but I wanted to include them to give an example of, of what could have been purchased. All right. In many cases, the coffin hardware replicated imagery that was seen on gravestones of the same period. So in the 19th century, we had floral motifs being the most popular. And there are many examples of coffin hardware exhibiting floral motifs in the Hearns Brothers catalog. For the Victorians, each type of flower had a particular symbolism and careful thought was put into just the right um, flower. Today, much of the meaning associated with these flowers has disappeared. However, in, in the 19th century, this was a way to uh, communicate. In Christian iconography, the lily and the rose represent purity, and examples of foliage and fruit are suggestive, suggestive of how uh, lush heaven is. The grape vine was a very popular choice, and it represents Christ in the vine and followers in the branches. Ivy leaves refer to Christian uh, constancy and laurel leaves victory over evil and palm leaves for peace, victory and excellence. The daisy on the other hand was purity and peace and rosemary was remembrance. In addition, religious images such as crosses and Bibles were also popular. So in this example, we see a gravestone on the right featuring floral images. And then from the catalog, you can see, again, floral images on the coffin handle. All right. Hand, motif, hand motifs were very popular on gravestones as well. Um, and this is seen throughout Ontario. They represent an expression of a relationship between the living and the dead. In this example, in both the gravestone on the right and the coffin hardware on the left, we see the upwards pointing hand. 
which is indicating the path that the deceased has followed up to heaven. So this is uh, an example uh, from the Farewell Cemetery on the left after conservation treatment, which brought out uh, the motif quite nicely on this example. Okay. So this one might be a little difficult to see, but this is a, a mourning woman. Uh, figures are seen on gravestones. However, they're not as frequent um, frequently seen as we would see hands or flowers. Mourning figures are often depicted as kneeling, um, crouching, or uh, leaning over something. Uh, in this example, we see a woman leaning on either a small obelisk. And this small stone's in the Farewell Cemetery. And it's for a young child by the name of Julia Wright. And we can see um, in the uh, picture of the motif that there's a female figure. She has long skirts on and she's weeping into a handkerchief over a small headstone. Likely the figure represents the maternal presence um, because when you look up the genealogical information of Julia Wright, uh, she was only uh, two years old when she passed away. And on the bottom, we see a coffin handle from Farewell and you can see the mourning figure. And this one appears to be uh, crouching or kneeling as opposed to the other one, which is leaning. But uh, it's quite elaborate, it's quite an elaborate um, motif. There was a number of box handles and screws uh, apparent in the Farewell collection. So what we, we started to see with the Farewell collection that uh, a lot of it was very similar in style and variety to what we were seeing in this uh, Hearn Brothers uh, catalog. Handles that were used to carry the coffin were usually of the swing bale or a short bar type. They would be fastened to the coffin side by lugs, which were usually decorative, or they would use a backing plate and two or four screws to hold them in place. Thumb screws had large white metal heads attached to an iron screw and were used to fasten the lid to the coffin. Thumb screws were usually paired with escutcheons, which were flat decorative metal plates that were screwed to the coffin and used as a guide for the thumb screw. After the lid was placed on the coffin, the thumb screws were inserted through the escutcheons. White metal coffin screws were used for decoration and were basic iron screws that had ornamental white metal heads on them. Coffin studs made from tin were four-sided, star-shaped or round, and were used to cover the screws or nails, giving them a neat decorative finish. Okay. All right. Yeah, it's, sorry. The, no oh, worries. <laughs> the next, uh, this slide also features other um, handles and screws. On the right, you can see a box uh, handle and on the left, uh, a type of screw. So you can see they were quite uh, ornate and even after, what, 125 years, they're still, um, uh, still in pretty good shape and have some nice, um, Nice detail to them. Okay, Melissa. Much like the, the catalog that we used for study, the coffin hardware from the Farewell Cemetery represented a great cross-section of styles and finishes. Um, if you remember from earlier, I said that you could get this coffin hardware in many different finishes and colors. There was such a wide variety. The range of variation in the artifacts recovered from the graves at the Farewell site is remarkable for the number of burials uncovered. Of the 38 graves excavated, 
28 of the burials included 19th century coffin hardware in the form of coffin plaques, swing bale and short bar coffin handles, decorative white metal screws, stamped tin, tin studs in various shapes, viewing window, a thumb screw, and escutcheons. Now I included this coffin sketch. This is from burial six, and this is something that the archaeologists uh, would do for every single burial. But I wanted to give you uh, an idea of how much hardware could be associated with a burial. So here you're seeing that they had six handles on this particular uh, coffin and that uh, various hinges and screws uh, associated with. And this is just what this is just one burial, burial six. But it gives you an idea of how much um, hardware was included. All right. Perhaps most interesting from the farewell site was this um, coffin hardware item that was not seen in the Hearns Brothers catalog, and it was actually previously unknown to the archaeologists. It's a rather unique decorative treatment for the exterior of a coffin. The hardware piece is a decorative metal strip with three studs in place. The other find is an unusual form of coffin designation that consisted of the letters G and W separated by a stylized heart. The G, W, and heart were created from fabric that was placed on the coffin lid and formed by brass studs nailed into the fabric. The letters represent the name of the deceased individual, George Weeks Jr. So this is quite um, an unusual uh, display of coffin decoration. And, and as I said, this was something that uh, up to that point, the archaeologists had never seen before. So after um, conservation, the uh, heart and the G and W came up very nicely. We can really uh, make it out. And these are some more examples of some of the um, coffin hardware from uh, the Farewell um, Cemetery. And much of the coffin hardware recovered at Farewell is similar to examples found at other contemporary sites in Ontario. These similarities suggest that most coffin hardware would have come from a few manufacturers and distributors. Cost would most likely have been an important factor in deciding what items were to be fixed to a coffin. Unfortunately, the available catalogs that uh, we were looking at, they do not have any price lists associated um, with them, which, which is very um, unfortunate. So we didn't uh, get to see what uh, the cost was for the uh, distributors or the consumers. Many of the coffin decorations, such as the studs, were manufactured of inexpensive stamped tin. Handles were made of various materials, such as white metal, plated white metal, and sometimes solid brass. The more elaborate coffins with an abundance of hair hardware do not necessarily indicate that it was a more expensive burial, since most of the hardware at the Farewell Cemetery was made of elaborately decorated white metal or stamped tin, which the archaeologists compared really to inexpensive costume jewelry. So these examples here, you can see a, a beautiful grape uh, motif on the upper right. Um, that's like beautiful. And you can see some of the others, the handles and uh, some of the fasteners there. Okay. So portions of this uh, presentation appeared as part of an article featured in the fall 2018 issue of 19th Century Magazine. And if you're interested in reading more about the Farewell Cemetery Coffin Hardware Collection, uh, Melissa is going to drop a link into the chat. So if you're interested in uh, reading the article, we'll put the link and you can um, read the magazine online. 
So that gives you a, a bit of an introduction to the wonderful hardware collection that the Oshawa Museum uh, possesses. And if you have any questions, please drop them into the chat and we'd be happy to answer them. Yes, I forgot to announce that off the top. Uh, so my apologies for that. If you do have questions, as Laura said, please drop them into the chat. There's also the handy Q&A function. So whichever function you're most comfortable with to get your questions out there. Uh, to start it off, there are two questions. Um, the first is, how much later were the farewell burials compared to those uncovered at the St. Gertrude's Church in the same area? I can start on that, Laura. You can add if you want after. Sure. So yeah. I'll just first say I have not seen that report for St. Gertrude's. Um, Laura might want to add to that a bit. Um, but there was a book published um, in cooperation with members of the church and ourselves, volunteers at the church, um, called Harmony Village, Remembering the Settlers in a Lost Cemetery. And we don't actually know who the individuals were that were found at St. Gertrude's. Um, we do know they were potential early settlers. Some of the last names put forth for family names of who they could have been were Annis, Farewells, Pickle, Stone, Rogers, Wilson, Correll, and Dearborn. We don't, we don't know for sure, unfortunately, but um, just more of an approximate date. Is there anything you can add, Laura? Like, have you yourself seen well, um, you know, what you mentioned is uh, certainly what we uh, think. The unfortunate part is that St. Gertrude's Church is not very forthcoming with the archaeological report. So it's, it's kind of difficult to speculate um, who exactly was buried there and also the dates because we don't have that report. And, um, you know, it would be nice to be able to, to look at the report and, um, you know, get a sense of if they did any osteological um, examination like they did at the Farewell Cemetery, it might help us date some of the burials better. But at this point, we don't know much more than what was published in that book. And, and if you know, I'm, oh, sorry, go ahead, Melissa. I just saw Bob's comment. So I saw that Bob mentioned is that the, it is the history of harmony, but the reason that book got started was because the individuals that started that book were curious about the burials that were at St. Gertrude's. So that's really what's kind of initiated that, that research into that. And right. as, as a shameless plug, I did put the link to the Oshawa Museum's online shop. If you were interested in purchasing that book, follow that link or find us on, um, you can find the link to our shop and, and search Harmony and that book would come up. Um, another question is for Laura specifically. What is the most interesting coffin plate that you have encountered? Um, um, geez, there's been a few, um, but I always um, find the ones for children to be very, um, uh, I guess, sentimental and uh, I seem to gravitate towards those. And I've, I've seen um, uh, one that was uh, an elaborate uh, mourning figure, something like um, I showed in the slide. And it, uh, it was for a young child in the uh, US. Uh, you know, when you're looking at cemeteries here in Oshawa, it's a bit different than being on the eastern seaboard of the U.S. and some of the larger um, cities where there was a lot more wealth and they certainly went in much more for this um, coffin hardware. But I would say it was probably that one that I saw uh, near Boston um, in a, a museum for a, uh, a young child and, and uh, quite an elaborate mourning figure. Thank you for that. Um, were, uh, were there any interesting personal items found in the coffins at the farewell burials? Uh, do you want to touch that one? I'm, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about the dress. There, yes, the, the pieces of the dress. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's probably the only, and there I believe there was a few buttons and material. Yes. Um, I think that's about the only like personal items that um, were noted, I yes. believe, off the top of my head without 
Um, but if I if I find any others, note I don't think there were though. No, there wasn't jewelry or anything no. like that from um, that was noted in the archaeological report. Mm -hmm. And um, the kind of idea was when they did the excavation, if they found a personal item that they could associate with a particular burial, then it would have been reburied with that person. Um, and then anything that um, they couldn't quite associate with uh, any particular barrel because you could see in the map that Melissa showed that it looked like there was a couple of burials that were overlapping other um, burials and um, so there wasn't a lot of personal things and I'm just thinking about um, that dress the remnants of a dress yep that was supposed about to be the only thing I can think of as well yeah What's that map sometimes people think there's lots of jewelry and things but there was nothing like that yeah, you can see, you know, it looks like a couple of the burials were overlapping. So sometimes it was a bit difficult to ascertain what went with what. But um, when I talked to the archaeologists, they were uh, very, very much um, in support of reburying anything that they found. But it didn't, uh, it wasn't much. There is another question in the chat mm -hmm. in regards to wanting to research information on a number of coffin nameplates, um, all from one family. Uh, it sounds like the situation was fairly similar with what happened with Farewell in terms of burials outside cemetery limits. And uh, this individual would like to research them more. Would one of the speakers or someone at the museum be able to help them? Is that something that we would be able to help with? It's, it's the Bethel Cemetery in Seagrave. Where would be the, would oh gosh. the Ontario, would they, with OGS, would they have records for that would, cemetery? Yeah, they probably would have the uh, records for that uh, cemetery for sure. Um, a list of the burials there. And um, remind me, is Seagrave in Scugog Township? So perhaps the Scugog Historical Society? Possibly. Yep. Yeah, I think so. You know, this whole um, process was um, very interesting. I mean, you know, it happened in the early 90s. And, um, you know, we, it was something that we were very happy that we were allowed to to be on site to witness the actual excavation. We were allowed to ask questions and uh, find out um, you know, more about the people that are, are buried there. And Melissa and I are actually working on a future blog post, which looks at some of the osteological analysis that came from the bones themselves, tells you a little bit about the diet and health of the people that were buried in the Farewell Cemetery. And that, of course, gives you an indication of the diet and health of um, people in Oshawa as well. So uh, we're working on that. Mm -hmm. I think another question came up about the reburial area being so small compared. You got to remember most of the coffins weren't even really left. Um, it's mainly bone material. Um, so yeah, and that's not an exact rep representation of the reburial. That's just the general vicinity showing where they're going to be relocated within the cemetery. So don't take into account the actual size of that square. It's just that's the area where they were reinterred to. Yes, and they can be reinterred, as Melissa said, in much smaller boxes um, as opposed to a full-size coffin. And they were all kind of put um, in one area further back into the cemetery. Still together. much much better than being on the road bulldozed yes. and forgotten about having water mains near you and stuff yeah. yes i'm taking a look at the chat there's no active questions in the q a uh and no other questions in the chat for now so with that, I am going to say a very hearty thank you to both Laura and Melissa for tonight's excellent talk. I really did enjoy it. And even though I've been working with this history for over 10 years, it's always great <laughs> to feel like I've taken something away from this and learned something new. So thank you. 
The last speaker series for 2021, as I said off the top, is taking place on Tuesday, November 16th, 7 p.m. And again, it's going to be here on Zoom. As I mentioned off the top, our guest speaker is Dora Nip. She is the CEO of the Multicultural Historical Society of Ontario, and her talk is going to be called Growing Up Chinese, Canadians Without Belonging or Citizenship. Registration for that should be available on the Oshawa Historical Society website and the Oshawa Museum website later on this week. So please keep an eye out for that. So once again, thank you all so much. Hopefully we'll see you next month for the talk and have a lovely rest of your evening. Take care, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>